Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll be running the session in a Q&A format. Um, I'll get the session started with a few questions, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, so Andrea, why don't we start by uh, telling us when did you first become interested in the entertainment industry, and what made you decide to fully transition over to the creative side after business school? Um, well, first of all, let me start by saying, I think this is great that you have this conference. I don't know how many years old it is, but when I was here, I gradu graduated in 1993. There was no such thing. There, were, there was no media and entertainment club. Um, there were very few resources for which to pursue this business and this career. And so I think it's fantastic that that's really evolved at the school. Um, but I really became interested. I mean, I've always loved media. I've always loved um, film and TV. And to be honest, never thought that I could have a career in it. I grew up in Silicon Valley and thought I was supposed to be an engineer, which is why I studied that in college. And then realized I didn't have to do that and went to Wall Street. Um, but it wasn't until I got here that I realized you could do really anything you want. And I would encourage all of you who are here to take these two years as a rare sabbatical in your life where you can pursue um, and figure out what you're passionate about. And that's what I did when I was here. I um, basically said, OK, what, do, what like floats my boat? What am, I, what am I interested in? What makes me want to get up every day? And it was three things. It was um, food and wine, entertainment, and travel. And so I spent the two years talking to every alum and every person in those three industries that would talk to me. And over the course of time, sort of honed in on what it was exactly that I wanted to do. I ended up with a uh, summer job at NBC uh, on the business side of the company. Didn't love the business side. It was on the sales side. It wasn't right for me, really. But met along the way a guy named Jeff Zucker, who now runs NBC Universal, who at the time was um, producing the Today Show. And I said to him, can I just come sit in your control room and see what it's like? And he said, sure. And I showed up at 5.30 the next morning. I sat in the control room and really loved it and then said, can I come tomorrow? And I ended up coming for the whole week and saying to him at the end of the week, can I come work for you? And so for the second half of my summer in business school, I was a PA for the Today Show and um, fell in love with TV news, decided that's what I wanted to do, um, and really came back to school to finish my second year and figure out how to get a job in it because there is sort of zero value placed on an MBA in the news business. So how do you get it? Well, I um, begged and pleaded for a job, talked about my passion about getting the job, um, interned at KGO TV in San Francisco for $5 an hour while I was doing that and ultimately ended up uh, at ABC at Primetime Live as my first job. So how has, since you graduated, how has the MBA helped or hurt you? Um, I think it helps in very subtle ways. It helps because um, you understand how the business works. You understand leadership. You understand, um, you have a breadth of understanding nobody else in the entertainment business does, at least on the creative side. Um, it is a, it can be an obstacle on the creative side, not on the business side. Um, if you want to be a creative person, if, you, if people know you have an MBA, they automatically think you're not creative, and they think you cannot be creative. So it, it, that's what I mean by an obstacle. You sort of have to shove it under the rug and start at the bottom and pay your dues and prove. And for years, I didn't tell anyone I had an MBA until now when I've you know, proven to them that, yes, I can develop shows and I know what I'm doing. Um, now I can talk about it again. And it does help me run my department. So there are pros and cons, but it, it just depends on what side of the entertainment business you want to be on. Okay. And what advice would you give Stanford MBA students who are interested in working in entertainment? I would say, I mean, it goes back to passion and figure out exactly what it is that flip, excites you about entertainment. Is it the business of it? Is it the distribution side of it? Is it the um, digital part of it? Or is it creating television or creating films? Is it writing? Is it all of those things? Really figure out what exactly about it is, is what your passion is, and then pursue it vigorously. And don't, you know, do whatever you have to do to get into it. Start at the bottom if you have to. Um, and because you're all smart people, you'll get there faster than anyone else. But don't take a job that isn't in the area that you really want to be in. Great, thank you. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to the audience for questions. I would just ask that you. Uh, 
you stand up when you're asked your question. And uh, if you could speak up for the microphones, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, like I said, you just told the story about uh, becoming a, how you got involved with Jeff Zucker. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the importance of mentors in your career and, and, and the role sure. that they've had, and also how you've actually developed some of those relationships? So, how did you first get in touch with Jeff Zucker to allow you to actually show up and, and spend the week with his show? Sure. Um, I think mentors are extremely important, and I think half the battle as you decide what job you're going to take is who you're working for and whether you have that in that person. Um, I've been really fortunate in my life that, you know, when I, with Jeff, I just went up to him after a brown bag lunch he spoke at and said, can I come sit in your control room? And then he saw my enthusiasm and my passion for it um, and responded to it. Now, even then, like when I, I came back to school and I wanted to come back and work for the Today Show when I graduated, I probably called him 50 times before he finally took my call. Um, and I wrote him letters and everything else. And it, But he responded to my passion for it and my willingness to keep driving at him until he uh, answered the phone. Um, with other people, the reason I went to ABC News was there was a guy named Paul Friedman who sort of took me under his wing. He was the head of news then. He was the number two guy in news, and he oversaw all the hard news coverage. And he just understood me. and he. I think because I walked into his office and said, uh, I want to do this and I'm passionate about it and I know what I'm talking about and I've done all my homework and I've watched your shows and I'm willing to work for peanuts and forget about my MBA, he really responded to that and took me under his wing and nurtured me. So I think people uh, want to help people who are passionate about what they do. So it goes back to that. I mean, and then, you know, just meeting people along the way and asking them for help. I mean, Bob has been a great mentor of mine, Bob Iger, through my career. Um, there have been many women who have been great mentors to me. And also, I feel an obligation to pay it back and do that for other people who are under me as well. Yeah? Um, so I have a question about um, what you've seen over time with respect to audience tastes and preferences, uh, which direction that's heading, and, and what's really made your, your programming, to your mind, um, very successful? Well, I think those are all sort of tied together. I think. Um, the one thing I would say is certainly an unscripted series, what in reality series and game shows and unscripted series, I try to tap into um, things that are extremely resonant in people's lives uh, and very broad and resonant. So they tap the best ones tap into some emotion in people or some broadly resonant theme. So for example, um, when someone walked into my office and pitched me The Bachelor, um, that was a pretty revolutionary idea at the time. I mean, certainly nobody had gotten engaged on TV before, and reality was a fairly new genre. But the idea that it would tap into the fact that everybody knows those emotions. Everybody's fallen in love. Everybody's been dumped. You, everyone knows what that is like and has a great um, interest in that subject and those emotions. And so I knew that, that it would strike a chord in people. Um, on a broader note, the reason Extreme Makeover Home Edition got developed was because we looked at the ratings of um, trading spaces on TLC, which was doing big numbers on a Saturday night on cable. And we said, there's got to be a primetime way to do this. And everyone said, oh, you can't do home makeovers in primetime. That's a daytime idea. It'll never work in prime. It took us about a year and a half to develop it. But um, ultimately, you know, we looked at Home Depot and Lowe's sales. We looked at the ratings of trading spaces, and we saw that home renovation was a huge um, area for development. What we didn't know when that, about that show, was, though, was the great surprise about that show was how it tapped into the goodness in people. And it came at a time, we launched it after 9-11, and people wanted to believe that this world is good and that people are good. And um, it really struck a chord in that way and made it a much bigger show than we ever thought it was going to be. Um, and then the last example I'll use is or both Wife Swap and Super Nanny. Wife Swap taps into um, the way we judge the way other people live. When we walk into somebody else's house and we say, oh, my God, I can't believe that they live in this messy house, or I can't believe they feed their, ki feed their kids ding-dongs every day, or whatever it is, that's what that taps into. Super Nanny obviously is about parenting, and there are many parents in this world. And even if you're not a parent, you've been to, like, you know, your sister's house and you can't believe she raises her kids that way and they run around like crazy kids. 
everyone has opinions about parenting and about um, kids' behavior, and that's what it, it really touches on that. Yeah. Well, I think that's hard to say because I've never actually really thought about that because my job is to hit as many people as possible in one big premiere of a show. Um, certainly, we use the internet where, where it makes creative sense involved in the show, but I'm not quite sure how to answer that because I wouldn't be able to give you a very intelligent answer. Sorry. Yes. What is your program doing in the direction of interactive television? What, what future directions is ABC setting in that regard? Um, I, I think from my perspective, I'm, I, I think of it as a way to drive creative for the main show. So I have a show in development right now that right now the only interactivity that exists on TV is your, when you vote for American Idol or American Inventor or whatever. That's really the extent of interactivity. Um, I have a show in development right now that um, if we launch it in summer, probably, you'll be able to play with the show. And it'll be a truly interactive show, I think, which will be really interesting. But again, for me, it's the tail. I can't allow the tail to wag the dog. My job is to get big ratings on ABC, whether the viewer is passive or interactive. Um, certainly, there's a whole interactive strategy for the television network, um, which is taking our brands, our shows as our brands, and distributing them through multiple platforms and being anywhere the viewer wants us to be. Um, but my job for, in terms of develop, creative development is to hit as many people as possible on the network. Yes? ABC has put a bunch of its shows online, like Desperate Housewives. Uh -huh. How well has that uh, taken off? I think it's done well. The ABC player, I think people are starting, I don't know what the figures are. But again, I think the strategy is to be anywhere the viewer wants us to be, whether it's on the main channel, paying $1.99 on your iPod to get it, or watching it with commercials on your computer or eventually on your telephone or whatever else. Um, that's where we'll go in the future. Um, the media player is working very well, though. Yeah? Returning to the topic of your personal experiences, you mentioned that with an MBA, it was hard to convince uh, some people you were working for that you had creative talent. But obviously, you've been extremely successful in that respect. And my question is, uh, is that something that came to you naturally? Or were, have you been, throughout your career, engaging in, whether it's school or in other places, in activities to develop your um, creative abilities and your, your uh, potential to contribute in that way? Well, you know, it's interesting. When I went into news, I had zero ex journalism experience. I'd never written for a high school paper. I hadn't done anything like that. I just liked it. and so. You know, being a researcher is not, and a PA is not brain surgery. So I went in there and I was willing to work for nothing. And they knew I was relatively intelligent. And so that's how I got in there. When I came to alternative series, um, part of it was lucky timing because they weren't going to put me in comedy or drama because I didn't know anything about comedy and drama development. But um, the department that I went into and the department that I run now was when I started. 25 specials in a late night franchise. There was no such thing as alternative programming. And so I really got in at the beginning and grew with the industry. Um, now, certainly you have insecurities about whether you can be creative or not. But one thing you realize is it's not like anyone else sitting around you is any more creative than you. They all started out as assistants. That doesn't make them any more creative than you. So all you have to do is exercise your brain in the right way and, um, and start you know, yeah, tra training your brain to think in different ways. And so one of the interesting things for me was I was an engineer. And when you're an engineer, you have a whole bunch of information, and you have to sort it down into a single problem and sol solve the problem down. So it's, a, it's exactly the opposite of the way you need to think to develop. You have to take a nugget and find a nugget in development and blow it up. And so it's really just over time training yourself to think differently. But I think anyone can do it who wants to. I have, a, yeah. I have another question. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see. Go ahead. Can you talk a little bit about uh, if you get a brand and how you think about shows you chose to differentiate yourself from your competitors? Sure. Um, it took us a while. I mean, 
ABC as a brand is a fairly broad, female driven, fairly female driven family brand, pretty clean brand. And that's really what my alternative series brand is. I think my brand is, pro the shows that I develop probably have a stronger brand than ABC in general. But it took us a while to find it. I mean, when I first um, started the job, Fox was doing incredibly well with Busted on the Job and um, Real Ghost, you know, Real Ghost Caught on Tape and um, really harsh cops, harsh reality. And who wants to marry a multimillionaire? Stuff like that. And we thought, should we chase that? Um, and occasionally we did try to chase it, and it really didn't work for us. So um, The Bachelor was the first big hit for us. And then on the heels of that, you know, the regular Extreme Makeover, which is really a queen for a day. And so then we started doing all these other shows and executed against a much more positive, wish fulfillment, aspirational, happy, um, bright and happy, brand and it started to work for us and then people came to expect those kinds of shows from us and um, so it, so it's been good. Yeah. Uh, who is the demographic that you develop for? Who, who are you trying to target? Uh, a, any adult 18 to 49. So that's what we get paid for and uh, that's the eyeballs that I need. I, but I do know that our programming, the sweet spot of alternative series is women. It's women 18 to 49, women 18 to 34. So every time we've tried to draw, to go after a male show, we've developed a show for men. Hasn't done as well. It's been really hard. Um, but the women tend to drive reality shows. Yeah. Sometimes it's difficult for us to sort of picture what you do on a daily basis. And I'm sure mm -hmm. no two days are really the same or no day is typical. But can you just kind of describe some somewhat typical days? Sure. In the office? Um, yeah, no, they are very different, which is, I feel lucky because I feel like I have the funnest job in the world. I mean, it's really fun. I meet interesting people every day. Um, I might have people come in for pitches. So producers will come in and it'll be a half an hour and they'll sit down and say, okay, I've got this great idea. I'm going to, um, it's a game show. For example, Mark Burnett came in and pitched me the show that premiered last night on Fox. It's, it's a game show about, um, can you beat a fifth grader? And all the questions are based on, you know, first to fifth grade knowledge. And here, let's play around a bit and see if you like it. And then, you know, there'll be a kit. You'll have two lifelines. In effect, you can ask a kid for an answer, and then you can ask the whole group. So basically, he'll come in and pitch that show to you, and you'll say, um, "Let us talk about it," or "I don't think it's right for us," or whatever it is, or "Yes." Um, I might screen a tape of something that. There are three places that I develop from. One is taking pitches from the U.S., from whoever the producers are that come in my door. The second is I scour every show in the world. I spend a lot of time in London uh, and around the world looking for different kinds of shows. Wife Swap, Super Nanny came from London. Dancing with the Stars came from the U.K. America's Funniest Home Videos came from Japan. Um, and try to find shows. So I might take a look, like I just took a look at a show that's on BBC Two the other day that I've been looking at for a long time and I really want to develop. And then I might, you know, um, have lunch with a piece of talent I'm trying to woo to come do a show with us. Or I might call up, it's so funny, I literally, this morning I called up Michael Eisner to ask him if he would do a show for us. So he laughed at me and said he would think about it. Um, but I think he'd be a great judge on one of our shows. Um, and then I might sit with my, like I sit with my department for two to four hours a week. And the third prong of our development is just internal ideas. So what's resonant to the point of earlier, those resonant themes in people. For example, we talk about um, faith and religion all the time. That's an extremely resonant theme in this country. And we haven't been able to figure out what the show is that gets at that. Um, we talk about psychics because people love psychics, and is there a show that can be developed around that? Um, in fact, yesterday I went to a psychic just to see uh, who was brought in in a pitch, um, just to see what the experience was like. So anyway, those are the kinds of things. And then I might have dinner with, um, I don't know, someone in the music business because I've done a bunch of with the country music business. I just brought the country music awards to ABC, and it had been on CBS for 35 years. and so. Um, that's a big, big franchise for us. Or I might go to a Jimmy Kimmel taping, which is our late night franchise, um, which is doing very well. So it's fun. Yeah. Um, 
to what degree do you feel like your shows reflect uh, society's values? And to what degree do you try to take an active stance in how society and what things society should value? Or is that question uh, not really on your mind? Uh, I try to tap into what the values already are. So I'm not trying to change people's values. I'm trying to tap into them. Um, I don't think that I can change them. I, my job is to entertain you. And, uh, but I can entertain you by tapping into what you care about. And so that's why it goes back to what's resonant. You know, a lot of it, by the way, much of television is developed that way. If you look, Oprah talks about what your values are right now. Oprah tapped into those things. We do a lot of, my brand, I think our brand is very similar to Oprah's in that we deal, tackle the same themes. You know, we just, actually we just had two of her specials on in the past two weeks. Um, now, certainly we aired a show called Oprah's Leadership Academy on Monday at 10, which was maybe trying to shape your values. I mean, it was an incredibly uh, aspirational show about her going to South Africa and building a school for girls. Not a ratings winner. We knew it wasn't going to be a ratings winner, but we did it because we thought it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. How did your research system work, and how do you see that changing in the future? The research system? Yeah. You know, it's hard. I think, we, you, well, there's the straight um, numbers research, which is we get a report card every morning that tells us how our shows did yesterday, and then which analyzes. Yes. So it's the straight, here's your adults 18 to 49 rating. Here's how it breaks down in upper income, A and B county versus C and D, education levels, all of that. And you can use that as a tool to say, hey, what is the show hitting? Um, and then there's the qualitative research, which is focus groups and phone surveys and cable tests and stuff like that. Those I really use as a tool for development. So I don't believe a focus group can tell you whether a show is going to work or not. In fact, like Seinfeld tested horribly. You know, major hits, The Bachelor tested horribly. Um, but it can tell you what people don't understand. So for example, I just put one of my shows through focus group testing where Shaquille O'Neal's doing a show for us where he's um, tackling childhood obesity, which we think is a huge problem in this country. And we wanted to do a crusade show. And we, we brought Shaq in, who cares a lot about this issue, and he's trying to tackle it in the, in the state of Florida. So he's picked six kids that he's trying to help. And then he's trying to attack the school system and school lunches and parenting and everything around it that's causing the problem. Anyway, so the first episode came in and we tested it so we could understand what people are understanding and not understanding about the episode. So it's a tool for us in terms of how we edit a show, but we never use it to say, oh, this show should go on the air or this show shouldn't. Yeah. Can you share uh, the economics of your business a little bit more? Um, yeah, I can s somewhat. I mean, they basically, you know, the cost of your program is fairly unrelated to the revenue side of it, except because unless you believe cost drives ratings, which I don't. Um, you have a license fee that you pay for a show or, or an amount of money that you pay to make the show. And for a drama, that can be two to three million dollars an episode. For a comedy, which is a half hour, it could be a million and a half to two. Our shows run 750 to a little over a million, probably. And then uh, whatever that rating, whatever the show does in rating converts into dollars based on the number of adults 18 to 49 who watch your shows. And it's called a cost per thousand, a CPM, cost per thousand adults 18 to 49 who watch your show. That's how advertisers pay us. And so. Um, in the economics of drama usually require you to run the show twice, which is why there are lots of, you know, you can make 22 episodes of a drama in a 52-week year and you rerun them. Um, our shows, when you have a show like Super Nanny or Wife Swap or Home Edition where they're episodically contained, or, or, um, or America's Funniest Home Videos, which you can run the sprockets off of, those repeatable shows make a lot of money because the cost is zero the second time you've run it and the ratings are good. With a show like The Bachelor or Dancing with the Stars, you can't run, rerun those shows because the outcome is already out there. So you've got to be a profit on the first run. And are most of your revenue advertising It's 100% advertising. The difference between broadcast and cable is cable has a huge advantage because they get subscription fees as well. It's, uh, the broadcast business has become a tougher and tougher business to make money in.
Yeah. You mentioned earlier in your career you were, uh, um, uh, that you were passionate about news and stuff. So do you have an opinion about television news um, and you know, relevance today in terms of you know, Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I still have lots of friends in news, and I still watch a lot of it. Um, I think that the evening news, the 6.30 news, sort of makes no sense anymore. Nobody's home at 6.30. Nobody's watching that. Um, so in television news, the gold is in the morning shows from 7 to 9 because that's where people are getting their television news. It feels like most of people are getting their news online, though, right now. So it's either TV or online. Not as many people are buying newspapers anymore. Um, but I think there is a place for morning shows that will be there for a very, very long time. I think there's a comfort to being able to turn on your TV and find out what's going on in the world and have someone you're very familiar with, whether it's Diane or Matt, delivering that to you. Yeah. Uh, you talk about the gender demographic alliance being your target, but yet uh, a lot of studies show that 18 to 25, based on the 30s, are not watching much TV, uh, yeah. a large margin, they're doing a lot more internet. I'm wondering if you think it makes, still makes sense to talk about a mass audience in this demographic, or do you really think it's disintegrating and splintering so that uh, it really doesn't make sense to talk about the whole group? As, as well, well. I, I think it becomes more and more challenging as over time as more and more choices exist. Actually, young people are watching as much TV as they ever have. Um, and the total viewing of the number of minutes or hours of total viewing of television has gone up per day rather than down. It's like eight hours and six minutes a day or something like that that an average person watches TV. It's a lot of hours. That said, you're right. It becomes hard. The business gets harder and harder. Um, and what used to be easy to aggregate a mass audience of people now, I mean, I think when we think about programming, it's got to be event driven. It's got to be, I mean, we are in the broadcast business. So that's who we, that's the only way we can monetize. We can't really fragment. Um, but we obviously own cable assets, the Walt Disney Company does, and we have an online business that serves those s smaller, more specific tastes. But ABC as a broadcast network's strategy has to be to hit a broad audience. And so we have to think about programming that, for example, to TiVo proof it, you must see today rather than wait till tomorrow morning after everybody's seen it and is talking about it. So Dancing with the Stars is the perfect broad TiVo proof show because nobody wants to go to work the next day and find out who was eliminated without having seen the show. The Super Bowl is one. Sports are, are big events. Specials are, are important. Um, things that you have to see right now. And that are shared experience, really, is what I'm trying to get at. Uh huh. So you, you touched on this a little bit. I, I saw Nelson um, uh, report recently and it I think for the first time it broke out um, the top shows and also the top DVR shows. And I took notice of the fact that, um, you know, American Idol was number one, American Idol Tuesday was number two, et cetera. But the top DVR shows were more the uh, expensive uh, dramas. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could comment on, you know, how this is sort of you know, reshaping your industry and what, what the strategy is to combat that. Um, you know, it's challenging. I think really the strategy is, um, again, to try to create events, um, to try to be everywhere the viewer might want you. So to focus on the consumer and provide opportunities to watch online the next day or to download it onto your iPod or whatever it is. Um, and also to fight with Nielsen to include DVR. You know, you've seen... Nielsen has now started putting out ratings for um, live plus same day delay, live plus seven day delay, so they can now measure um, if you've T-voted and watched it or not. So does this mean that it inevitably the broadcast industry is going to go move, continue to move away from the uh, expensive dramas and that they'll, they'll shift to the subscription channels like HBO? And I don't think so. Okay. I think that... Um, you know, one of the hard things is, one of the things I'm exploring right now is low-cost drama. And can you do, because I think that obviously we would be much more profitable if we could do lower-cost dramas. But it's very hard right now because the viewer has come to expect a level of quality that's almost feature film quality for, in shows like Lost and Desperate Housewives and Grey's Anatomy. And so very hard to put a cheap show on next to that or a cheap-looking show. Um, 
So I think we have to do it. But again, it's, there's no easy answer. I think the business just gets harder and harder all the time. Yeah. Yep. Other ways to so it doesn't matter if people are skipping along. Yeah, I mean the advertising um, business because they're concerned about it also has become very aggressive in wanting to be integrated into shows. So we have conversations with them all the time. You know, I'm the guardian of the creative, and yes, I understand the economics, but I'm not going to stick like, um, you know, a vacuum cleaner in the middle of Dancing with the Stars. Um, in fact, it makes me crazy that we had to do that, that slim fast thing. For anyone who watched the show, watches the show, it, it was just like horribly done. Um, but when you can do it well, for example, when we integrated Sears into Extreme Makeover Home Edition, it was organic. It, they gave money to the production so we could get, make the homes better. They gave like $50,000 an episode to the home and in appliances and all of that stuff. Um, they got a great halo effect of goodwill mm. off of it. We got what we needed, and when it works, it's very, very good. But yeah, I mean, we have to keep pushing in that direction. Yeah? Today, most of TV programming is sliced and scheduled in one hour increments, occasionally 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. What do you think about shorter formats, you know, 15, 10 minutes? I think it's hard to get people to tune in. So, for example, people there's a habit of tuning in on the hour or maybe on the half hour. Um, so Jimmy Kimmel is an extraordinarily, it's, it's grown tremendously as a show, but that show starts at 12.06.30, and it's the biggest obstacle to growth in that show, in my opinion, because nobody knows that they should go turn on Jimmy Kimmel at 12.06.30. So we rely on, an, on a lead-in of Nightline, which makes no sense also, because it's a completely incompatible show. Um, I just don't think people tune in off the clock. Um, how involved are you Um, we keep 100% of creative control, so um, certainly there's a collaboration that you have with the producer, and you know you don't want to be maniacal about telling them what to do because that's la like the worst thing you can do to a creative person. Um, but yes, we have creative control, and we work with them to get the product everyone's happy with. Yeah. Um, in making the decision on which show to pick, uh, how? How does licensing future revenues for the title itself? If it looks like it's going to offer a good licensing stream, does that have an effect on your decision? Uh, it doesn't have a, it's so funny, it doesn't have an effect on my decision because all I care about is getting ratings for ABC. But, you know, my international people scream at me all the time. They're like, how could you not, like, why do you keep buying shows from the UK when you should be creating shows that we can sell? <laughs> or, or why do you keep doing shows with American production companies who keep all the international rights? I mean, because every, everything's a negotiation. So if it's developed in-house, um, you obviously get the international and syndication and all of that and distribution. If somebody comes to you with the idea, you might not get that. And, but that's not my job. I only care. I only, it's so interesting. The reward system for me is ratings. It's not how much money a show makes. It's how many rating points did you get. Yeah. ABC Sports is obviously huge. It's not your the area where you focus, but do you have any comments on trends in sports broadcasting and specifically women in the audience and women as producers in sports? <coughs> um, I think ABC, well, specifically to ABC Sports, has really been rolled into ESPN, and ESPN is by far the most powerful and wealthy and profit-making entity in the Walt Disney Company. So sports are extremely important to us. Um, I can't really speak to strategy about where they're going. Certainly rights are important. Um, I know many female producers in sports who have come out of sports. And I think it's totally a, it's an open field there for them. Uh, what else would I say? And a lot of women watch, if you look at Sunday Night Football or Monday Night Football and you look at the demos of those shows, um, I think Desperate Housewives took a little bit of a hit from NBC having Sunday Night Football on in Prime because uh, that show is about 40% women viewers, which is surprising, I think. Yeah? Um, so you talked earlier about the process of taking that you know, nugget, that idea, that uh, kind of resonant theme, and kind of blowing that up into 
a bigger idea. Can you talk about the process of, of doing that? Do you usually you know, play around with a bunch of different themes at the same time, a bunch of different ideas, and how do you narrow that into something that's, that's uh, you know, producible? Sure. I mean, you sit there and you t say, okay, well, we've got a um, home renovation show we want to do. What are different <laughs> ways to do it? We could um, go in and make over a house every week. We could have two design teams in competition to, build, to design the greatest house. We could, um, what's another way to do it? Uh, we could have teams uh, or pairs of contestants who have to design various rooms in a house and each get eliminated every week. Based, so you could do a multi-episode kind of show. You could do a go in and fix it show on one, one episode. And then you start talking about the pros and cons of all those things and you start narrowing it down, down where you want to go. Um, or take The Bachelor. When The Bachelor came into our office, it was, here's the pitch. One guy, great guy, 25 women. Every week he dates them and narrows it down. And the only thing he had, the only, and then he ultimately picks one and gets engaged. The only thing the producer had besides that was, every week he's going to hand out roses. And, uh, we, and so clearly the show needed much more development than that. And so before... <laughs> Before we did it, I said to him, okay, so we got to develop this show. What happens every episode? Because, you know, and we talked about the fantasy and aspiration of it and that it needed to be set in a beautiful place. The Bachelor's going to live in some fabulous Bachelor mansion. And he has to be held up on a pedestal like a hero so that you believe that he deserves to be dating these 25 women. He has to be, and I remember vividly in my head thinking, okay, um, this guy needs to be basically John Kennedy Jr. The first guy has to be like, the, you know, some version of that. He has to, and he has to have the right education, the right back, all of that stuff. You know that he was a Stanford alum, the first guy. Yeah, he's five <laughs> years behind me. Um, so, and, so I cast him in that. But anyway, and then when we talked about the elements of the episodes, we said, okay, well, what is natural in a courtship? Well, one of the natural things in a courtship is you go out on first dates. The second one is you meet the person's friends. So that's where we brought the friends into episode three, I think it was. And then um, there's the meeting the parents and going to their homes and seeing what their homes are like. Um, and then, of course, you get to the overnight date. Like, you know, you get to a certain point of seriousness in the relationship. And then, of course, you would meet his parents right before. So those are all the elements that we started to build the, sh the episodes around. Um, and then it's about sort of shaping the casting and, and finding the voice for the show. That nugget. Every show is different. I mean, a reality show probably, I'm trying to remember, we greenlit it in the summer and we shot it. it went to air in April, so it took about nine months. That's about the right length for a reality show. Andrea, I had, a, I had another question. Sure. Just on going back to your career track for a second. You, you started off as a, as a researcher at, at Primetime Live, and within a few years you were a vice president and executive assistant to Bob Iger. That's a pretty extraordinary track. Can you talk about how, how that happened? Yeah, uh, you know, again, I got very lucky. I was in the news division. Uh, the mentor I told you about, or referred to earlier, Paul Friedman, who was in news, said, look, I'm going to bring you, well, you're going to come in here and you're going to work in news, and either you're going to love it and you're going to be a great executive producer someday because of your business skills, or, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And what happened was Bob was the head of the uh, he was the head of the network at the time, and he and his number two were looking for somebody <coughs> that they could bring in to help them with special projects, that they could um, teach the business of the network to, and sort of groom to be in management at some point in time. And they were looking for somebody uh, with production experience and with an MBA and who worked inside the company. And I was the, really the only one. And Paul heard about it and called me up and said, go meet with these people. And I got the job, so I was just very fortunate. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit, oh. about, uh, talk a little bit about how the TiVo has changed the importance of product placement in shows? Well, I think to um, the point earlier that it's just become more and more important to advertisers, that they are much more aggressive now in trying to place their product inside of shows. Um, and it's, you know, it's a push and pull between us to find the right way to do it that makes sense and adds value to them and helps them sell product and works for the creative. Yeah. 
You're definitely in an unpredictable and unstable business. So yes. how do you deal with failure in the business? Do you cut the program straight away or do you try to amend it and make it better and hope that in the future you will cut some of the range that you hope for? Uh, secondly, yeah. um, how do you deal, how can you survive in the long run such a business? Do you have to take big risks or should you take like cautious steps that are gonna lead you to success? You mean in general or Yeah, in general, like in your profession. Well I mean, it is a roller coaster business, and I have had major, major failures uh, among the th many shows that I've launched. And so, number one, I mean, emotionally, you just have to like stay the course and say, okay, this is we're going to keep going, and we're going to keep finding shows that are going to work, um, because it can be emotionally extremely taxing. I mean, I have like colleagues and competitors who will literally stay up all night and hug their lucky football helmet, waiting for the ratings to come in. Um, and you know won't show up at work for three days if they don't if they don't hit. Um, I try to be more even tempered than that. But uh, you in broadcast you don't have time to tinker with and fix a show. Basically, unfortunately, if you can't launch a show in the first two maybe three episodes, it gets taken off the air. Um, in cable, you can. So a good example in cable is. You know, Bravo, Bravo, the first time they launched, um, what's the designer show? You know, um, Project Runway bombed. Nobody watched it. Not a single person watched it. It was a disaster. Then they took the show and they basically pretended it never happened and relaunched it and ran it so that it got huge exposure and just aggregated viewers to come to the brand and they caught fire and now it's a major asset for them. Um, so in cable, you can afford to do that. In network, you can't. Um, and with respect to failure, you try to look at a show, you analyze what didn't work about it, and you try not to make the same mistake again. Um, but ultimately, the other part is we're in a failure-driven business. You know, 95% of the shows that get put on the air don't work. A whole season of shows gets launched every September. Maybe two of them work out of 30 there are 40 that are launched. Um, so it's challenging. And then, sorry, do you, do you, I always. How do you survive the long run? Such a business that you have to take big risks in order to be able to be successful. I think you do, you, you, you have to, um, sometimes you have to take big risks. Dancing with the Stars was probably the biggest risk I ever took um, because people thought I was truly out of my mind. I mean, most of my, even my own inter inside the company, People thought we were crazy. They were like, I can't believe you're going to launch a ballroom dancing show. You're going to ruin the brand of the network. It's going to be a disaster. The promos are embarrassing. You know, all of that stuff because, you know, it was a live show, so we didn't have any material to promote it with. We had to use the British material. And um, it was really, really, really scary. But if you believe in something, you have to. Now, look, I, I've done that before and lost also. Um, but I think you have to. You have to swing at the bat. and. Um, and I was fortunate that I had a boss who let me do it, even though he didn't believe in it, which is also rare. So, yeah. How do a product placements and advertisers' values affect creative content of some other shows? I try to not let them. I try to, they are secondary to me. So when someone comes in and says, I've got this great show, and by the way, it's brought from OMD and it's all paid for. Um, I don't care about that. All I care about is the creative of the show and whether the idea is going to drive ratings. And if I think the idea is going to drive ratings, then I'll try to figure out a way for them to integrate into it that's not going to hurt the rating. So it's really, for, first and foremost, the creative of the show. Secondarily, let's try to bring in some dollars through the... Now, that's part of, by the way, the incentive system. Let's say I was <laughs> rewarded on the amount of money that my show's made. I might have a different approach, but ultimately I'm rewarded for ratings. Yeah. Personality and like your skill set, do you think is make you successful in television? Um, I like people, so I'm fun. I'm really interested in people, and I'm interested in ideas, and uh, I think being open-minded um, and curious. What else? Um, I think that having a, sort of a groundedness helps me a lot, and a self-confidence that came from my parents because it's a fairly insecure business and can really, it can be really hard to work in um, if you don't have that, I think. And um, what else? I don't know. I think a lot of it is, I, I've been very lucky also. Yeah. So oh, flexibility would be the other thing I would say. 
ABC has uh, recently started showing its full-length shows uh, on its website. Sorry, what's that? Uh, ABC started showing its full-length shows on its website. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about the decision to do that and how successful it's been. Um, well, I don't know exactly the numbers of people who have watched it, um, but it has been very successful for us. It has the studies, like if you look at the research on it, um, you know, you have to watch the commercials through it. Um, the recall on the commercials is much better than on TV, actually. Um, so the advertiser is getting a, a really a better deal off of the viewers on that, uh, on the player. And um, so everything about it is positive. The view, the, so the viewer loves the experience. The advertiser is getting more bang for their buck than in anything else, I think. And um, it provides a service to, to the viewer that, that is great, I think. CPMs, the CPMs that you see on online viewing versus the CPMs that you see off of broadcast viewing? Um, I actually don't know what those are. Sorry. <coughs> yeah? I talked a few times about the value of the brand and ruining the brand or strengthening the brand as a network. My impression of the way that people watch television is that I, I don't see a lot of brand loyalty to a network but to an individual show. Right. So I wonder if you could elaborate on what value you think that provides, the brand as a network, and, yep. and why, why not just... You, you, you mentioned not picking certain shows because they didn't fit in with your brand. Um, and maybe that's because that doesn't work for the team that you put together, but if there's, you know. You know I think that's a really, really good question and one that we debate all the time because ultimately the shows are the brands. People are going to watch Desperate Housewives. They're not going to watch. They're not tuning into ABC. They're tuning into Desperate Housewives. They're, they're tuning into Extreme Makeover Home Edition. What, but what helps us when staying on brand is that there's viewer flow, and the way you get exposed to a new show is by watching the shows that we have on our air. So if you're watching Home Edition, you're likely to watch Wife Swap or Super Nanny or Dancing. If you're watching Home Edition, you're probably not going to watch um, Cops. And you're probably not going to, you know, I'm trying to think of, or Fear Factor. So um, it's about who are, who are network hits so that when we run promos, it, the, uh, the people who are watching will respond to the show. So that's, I think, where the ABC brand comes in, is a halo effect on our ability to launch and promote a show. Um, I think men don't really come to ABC in the same way that they come to Fox, especially young men. So our ability to launch a show like um, shows on Fox or like Fear Factor would be hard, would be really difficult. But I do think also that it's interesting because my, my department is two of us are women, <coughs> five are men who develop the alternative stuff. So it's not that our expertise is necessarily in this, because I think people is an interesting point. Um, but we understand that that's what works for our viewers. And occasionally, we try a male-driven show, and it just sort of, in fact, we have one now we're trying to do. We'll see. We, did, we launched one last year that was a disaster, mainly because of execution, though, I would say. Yeah. Um. I was wondering how you uh, manage product life cycles. Um, how do you know when it's the end? Is it is it purely a ratings game? Yeah. And then how does that contrast <laughs> to the British model, uh -huh. where if I look at the uh, coupling or the yeah. original Office or that Helen Mirren uh, detective series, it yeah. seems to Prime have been suspect. short, designed to be short. Well, it's so interesting in the UK that uh, they'll put on a show and it'll work, and then they'll take it off after six episodes and not bring it back for a year. I don't really understand that. Um, I think that maybe part of it is, is that that is a four or five network world. So they're, they have a TV business that's similar to where we were 20 years ago, and they don't have to worry about competition as quite as... It's changing a lot, by the way, but they don't have the same constraints that we do uh, and the pressure to pull a show off the air if it's doing a two or to continue a show that's doing a six for as long as you possibly can. Um, so... I do find it odd, though. You know, Super Nanny was a four-episode show on Channel 4, and then we got Joe Frost, and they made the mistake of not <coughs> locking her up in first position in the UK, so we have her for as, as many episodes as we want. It's, it's strange, actually. Um, but I think, the biz I think they're learning a lot from the business over here and are probably changing that model. It seems like slow death in the case of, of many American series. Dramatic yeah. series. Well, you run them out for as long as you can. I mean, you get a law and order, and it runs for 10 years. Um, it'll be interesting to see how long Lost runs, because that's, those kinds of shows are much harder to make last for a long time. 
And then the shows that I do tend to burn brightly and fast, so they'll break out into a huge rating, and then, you know, like The Apprentice is basically dead. Um, so it all depends on the show. Yeah, you run them until the ratings are. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Not going to be successful. What kept you on path? Um, I think when we first watched it, first of all, I passed on it twice before I said yes to it. Um, and the first two times that it was pitched to me, it was an older British salesman from the BBC who wasn't a creative person, and I just didn't. I was like, well, this is not going to work. British t television is is. Uh, measured on total viewers rather than young adults. So I'm sure this, skew, this show skews like 70 plus. And <laughs> people don't like ballroom dance. There's no history of ballroom dancing in the US. It, it was based on a show 20 years ago that was like an iconic show in the UK. I said, this is never going to work for us. Um, and then the producer came in, and the producer's a peer of mine and a friend. And I had a drink with him one night. And he said, Look, you know, I just want to talk to you about the show again. I'm telling you, this show will work for you. It is a leap of faith. I'm asking you to take this leap of faith. I said, yeah, but it's going to skew all. He said, no, no. Lots of my friends watch it. I started taking ballroom dancing because of the show. And I said, oh, wow. Um, he said, promise me you'll just take the episode and watch the whole thing. So I brought it in the next day. I pulled my whole department in. And I said, we got to watch this one more time. So we watched it and with, with our hand on the fast forward button. And they, someone inevitably said, stop every time we hit the button because we found ourselves mesmerized by the so many things about it. It's a first of all, the show just makes you smile. You watch it and it makes you smile. It's bright, it's happy, it's colorful. It is. Um, we became engaged in these celebrities we didn't know because they were British celebrities, but they were. You could see that they were putting. They had so much at stake. You know, they're putting their hearts on the line. They're learning something really hard, and then dancing live in front of millions of people. So there was that appeal to it, and then also. Um, it's a backdoor, it's a very backdoor sexy show. So it's an incredibly sexy show without being overtly saying that it's sexy. Um, and so I think for all of those reasons, we said, are we crazy? We turned on at the end of the episode, we said, are we crazy? Or do we all really like that show. Should we do it? Um, and we went to my boss and said, okay, we really want to do this show. He was like, I don't get it. And I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do it cast contingent. So if we hate the cast, we can bail out at the last second. And um, so we started trying to cast it. Of course, nobody wanted to do it. And um, we were down to the wire. We were down to the last point where we had to pull the trigger or not pull the trigger. And we had like two people booked, and that was it. And I don't even remember who they were anymore. Um, but they weren't good. And <laughs> we, we so wanted to do it that we just sort of made up. Like we knew we, had to, we could get two other people. And we said, OK, Steve, here's, we're, it's going to be a great cast. Don't worry. And I'm not even sure we told them the names. And we just said, let's, let's go. And I said, look, it'll either be, this is not going to be a show that's middle of the road. It's either going to be a great success, or it'll be a noble failure in which we took a great risk. And, and um, we can just shove it under the carpet, and you'll never know that it happened. And um, we got lucky because Evander Holyfield, which was the linchpin of the first season, came in at the 11 and a half, you know, 11th hour, basically. And he's the one who brought men into the show and was critical to getting it off the ground. So with that, I think we'll conclude the session. And thank Andrea for uh, taking thank the time you. to meet her today.